What's up, y'all? got another banger, but this one's a little bit different. So, ladies and gentlemen, hold on to your seats because tonight we have a guest who's not just prepared to make points, smoke cigs, but he's also here to raise them. Joining us is Andrew Wilson, a master of reason and rhetoric. Man, well, I appreciate you jumping in. Really, the focus of this is just to kind of learn more about you. I've been watching your content for a while. I've been seeing you on the whatever. I just watched you destroy Matt Dillahunty for probably the third time. Um, and I, what's funny is it's I... It's funnier watch, every time, doesn't it? It does, it does. He just rage quits, <laughs> yeah, IRL. Um, but I remember watching him in college and thought, Oh man, this guy's smart, but then I saw you destroy him and I was like, I, he pretty much lost all credibility for me. Um, but yeah, man, I'd love to just learn more about like, I feel like a lot of the stuff online is mainly your debates, what you're doing now, as opposed to what you've done in the past. But yeah, if you wouldn't mind, just talk to me a little bit about your childhood. What was it like growing up in the Wilson household? Uh, my dad was sent off. He was an entertainer. He was a musician. Hmm. Oh, cool. And he was drafted during the Vietnam War. Excuse me. He was drafted in the Vietnam War, and he was sent to the Philippines to Clark Air Force Base. Hmm. And uh, while in Clark Air Force Base, um, his wife divorced him and uh, took his children from him. Jeez. And this was a different era. And because of the era that he lived in, I mean, they just defaulted to the woman immediately. Right. So uh, when he got out, shortly after he got out, uh, he got extremely ill and had to move in with my grandparents because he uh, he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Mm. And there wasn't much in the way of treatment at the time for that disease, and there still really isn't much in the way of treatment for that disease. Yeah, They gave him a year to live, and, uh, and that was it. Well, he lived much longer. He's still alive to this day, in fact. Uh, he lived with the disease. Uh, he was fortunate. He met my mom. My mom had uh, some children from another marriage. And of course, my dad had children from his marriage, and um, so they they met. And uh, there's a fairly significant age gap of I think around um, I think around eight eight years, ten mm. years, something in there. Um, and she adored him, absolutely adored him. And so um, so then, you know, they had uh, me, and then they had my sister. So uh, total, there's uh, there's seven of us. So I grew up in Big a family, in a, yeah, a household. It was uh, seven. Now, some of my siblings were much older than me, so they came and went. Hmm. Um, there was most. There was about four of us who were young enough that we were together in the house at the same time all the time. Were you the youngest, kind of in the middle? Youngest. Youngest? Yep. Do you youngest think that's maybe where you get your litigation skills, debate skills, is from being? Because they always say the youngest kid is usually the best at, like, talking through things and being the best salesman or manipulator, I guess. Maybe with the, not a negative connotation on manipulation, but do you think that I don't, equates to some of your debate style and stuff? I don't, I don't think so. I think that um, I, I, base, I mostly avoided people uh, uh, <laughs> growing up. Like, I, I enjoyed solitude, kind of being more by myself. Mm. Um, and mostly, I think it, this was because there was just always people around no matter what. That makes sense. And so when I had an opportunity, um, as my folks began to make some you know, additional money and move us into places which, uh, which weren't so poverty stricken, uh, and you know, even if I had a small room, I, th I felt like that was a luxury. Hmm. And so, uh, so I, I spent most of the time that I possibly could, at least in the home, uh, in solitude if I could. I kind of avoided... Uh, siblings, uh, even kind of avoided my parents, but I had a very close relationship with my parents and siblings. Ultimately, uh, there wasn't any any problems that way. So when you so, iso sorry to yeah, interrupt you, when you isolated like that, were you reading books? Were you? It doesn't yeah. seem like you were, you know, playing video games. But like, no, what, what kind I of did play video games too. Um, but you got to remember, the video games that were around when I was young on the NES, SNES. Yeah. Most of the ones worth playing were role-playing games, and they were all it was all text, right? Yeah. So it was like reading a book in a way. No, you you <laughs> play those, yeah. It's all text playing props. Those, yeah, playing those old games was kind of like reading a book, but mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I did uh, I did read a lot. I still read a lot. Um, you know, and I had uh, I had a friend group, social groups. We moved around a lot, but my mom, uh, she's a nurse. And um, she worked in care facilities, like elder care facilities, mm. as the head of nursing. So what they did was they would hire her, move her in to clean up a care facility, um, one that was going downhill. One of those types of facilities where you walk in and the smell is gagging. Oh. It just smells like old people, urine and feces. Yeah. Um, and her job was to go in and turn those facilities around. And it mm. was a very high stress job, though it paid a lot of money. Yeah. 
I know the modern dating scene sucks, but so does getting hurt physically. Have you ever been the victim of a personal injury case? Every year as an image consultant, I meet so many different types of clients, and a lot of them are recovering from injuries or accidents, ranging from car accidents to workplace injuries. And I was extremely surprised to see how many people lost their personal injury cases, which is why I'm here to talk about Morgan and Morgan. America's largest injury law firm. They specialize in a wide variety of personal injury cases, and they have won thousands of big cases. And if you do end up working with them, they will fight for the money you deserve. Just recently, Morgan & Morgan secured verdicts of $12 million in Florida and $26 million in Philly. That's up to 40 times the highest insurance offer. And I'm telling you, your case could be worth millions. And the best part is it's all free unless you win your case. If you have also been a victim of a personal injury or a serious accident, you can visit www.forthepeople.com slash Levi. Found in the description below where you can start your free claim today. Round and it mm. was a very high stress job, though it paid a lot of money. Yeah. And uh, my dad was sick. So um, because he was sick, he was kind of uh, st the stay at home mom. <laughs> <laughs> really? So well, because he had MS, you know, like yeah, he had MS. Couldn't yeah. work, right? He couldn't work. So, uh, luckily though, um, you know, she uh, she stuck it out with him and was very, you know, he's a, he was a good man. But the roles reversed about halfway through the marriage. Um, he uh, he was able to kind of fight fight his way back into a healthier situation, and she was able to stay at home for the uh, the interim period of her entire life while he worked. Mm. And um, he uh, he opened a very successful business, and uh, you know he's uh, he, he does very well for himself. So, dude, shout out to him. I've seen some of those documentaries of people with MS. Like, there's really nothing. I've seen them like maybe hit a pipe of weed, and that's like the best they can do. But it's yeah, crazy to well, us. he had a social he had a social circle of uh, other men that he dealt with who had multiple sclerosis. Almost, it wasn't uh, it's any type of official group, but mm. I think when you have that disease, you kind of find each other. Yeah, you know what I mean. People 100%. find each other. They're all dead. Really? And they all, they all died when I was a kid. God, that's crazy, dude. And he's still around. The last time he went in and got an MRI, uh, essentially there's holes all through his brain from the, from the disease. Right. But for some reason, like, you know, uh, luck, God, call it what you want. Yeah. Uh, none of them are in parts of the brain, which are, uh, I guess you would say completely necessary for human function so <laughs> all the voice like <laughs> yeah all of his faculties are just as good as uh, as when i was a kid that's and, wild you know yeah and he's uh he's 80 right so kicking ass and taking names so that's that's dope so since you had your dad around more it seems like growing up in the house mom was working what kind of role did your dad play on kind of shaping your values your worldview and things like that well, he he would work still from home. He would do, but he would do things like um, real estate, you know, like kind of side more yeah. more what you would consider side businesses than anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was a very uh, kind of man's man. So he was a product of the '40s. Yeah, right. That's uh, that's the era that that he came out of. So all the values that I had, which were instilled in me, came from that era. Yeah. And so it, 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 none of those values fit well uh, going to school in the 90s and then in the, in the uh, you know, early 2000s. None of those, none, none of those values fit at all. And so um, in some ways I was uh, something of a perpetual outcast, right? Right. So I, uh, I had the same low tolerance for bullshit I did, <laughs> you know, I do now then. Yeah. And so uh, I would end up in uh, in fights a lot, or you know, all, all sorts of issues. I just didn't put up with people's bullshit, right. and it was. But I had no expect expectation that I needed to. So right. uh, my dad never put down an expectation that I needed to be a you know bitch or take anybody's guff or any right. of that. But rather, kind of like uh, there was more of a duty there to um, to stand on my own. And the kind of value structure that I was taught needed to be essentially enforced. Right. So, so were you, would you say you were conservative at a young age? Oh yeah. Yeah. I yeah. was born based, dude. I was oh, okay. born See, based. My, my dad's based. Yeah. My dad, my dad was, was based. My grandpa was based. <laughs> and my grandpa's grandpa was based. <laughs> I'm from a long generation of, of just, you were born, <laughs> you were born that way. So right. my, my dad hated Democrats his entire life. He, he hated the left his entire life. He hated progressivism. My grandfather, uh, his dad absolutely loathed them. 
the woke culture of their time, even in, you know, you're talking conversations going back to the 90s when I was kind of old enough to start remembering them. Right. I mean, th these men just loathed the left in a way that um, that now I think would be refreshing to see. They would likely be considered domestic terrorists by <laughs> today's standards. Probably. Yeah. Um, Probably. From, from the kind of value structure that they had, mm -hmm. which... Um, interestingly enough was was just an assertion of masculinity that's all it is that's all it is well if and then i i saw a tweet the other day it was like uh, some feminist talking about like toxic masculinity and i'm like well things have been going really downhill since this whole toxic masculinity we've tried it your way the single moms have tried it why don't we bring back masculinity because it seems like things were a lot better back in those days so are, is most of your family do they are they based as well like your sisters your other siblings or are you kind of like uh, <laughs> the black sheep of the family. It's a mixed. It's a mixed bag. Um, I wouldn't say that they're progressive by any stretch of the imagination, but some of my family members are probably closer to the center. Mm. Um, but no, there's no progressivism. My dad wouldn't allow it. He just wouldn't. Wouldn't. He just wouldn't allow it. He wouldn't have anything to do with it. Right. Um, if you kind of had an utterance of a Democrat position, he was going to make sure that that was uh, str yeah, stricken from your mind by any <laughs> means necessary. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? He just was not going to have anything like that in his house. He just he just wouldn't have it. Well, you, I'm, I'm assuming you were raised pretty religious as well. Go to church on Sundays, Wednesdays, like pretty strict you know, or like not really. Not so really. I mean, my parents, my parents, very much Christianity meant a great deal to them. Uh, but they had the same struggle that most Protestants have, that, you know, different churches would become woke over time. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also moved quite a bit, yeah. right? We, we would move every every few years. So it's really hard if you don't put roots down to become a member of a church and really, you know, stick with that congregation. Yeah. So it's really tough. Well, I would say it was a focal point. And, you know, my parents always were, were very much uh, Christian values based and identified as being Christians. And that was part of the uh, kind of wholesale lesson package, if you will, the moral lesson package. I wouldn't say that they were, they were overly uh, practical or practicing uh, of the religion that way, where they were uh, at church all the time and this type of thing. Right. Do you think you moving around a lot also kind of leans you towards self-isolation the big family plus moving around a lot it's hard to make friends especially when you're a kid like you want to just fit in do you think that yeah. was kind of well i was um in, i was mostly just solid uh, i would engage mostly in solitude at my house right mm -hmm. but i was a i was a social butterfly i mean i enjoyed being around people and um so i, I mean I, I would make friends pretty quickly almost anywhere that i went i always had quite a bit of charisma uh, but I'm also just not an unpleasant person to be around. You yeah. know, it's like there are people who are just genuinely unpleasant yeah. to be around. And Energy I just suckers, was, dude. Yeah, yeah. And I just was never one of those everywhere that I went. Mm -hmm. um, if I went to a party, the party got better. Yeah. If I was around a social group, they were happy to see me. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. I was right. never the guy who was like, oh, fuck, Chuck's here. God, who invited Chuck? <laughs> oh, yeah. God, can, he, can he get Chuck the fuck out, out of here, this yeah. guy? You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, okay, that makes sense. So, well, because I was going to make that correlation. You already did. But it's like, it seems like you're very good in social circles, even though you isolated as a kid. And in my opinion, when you're younger, that's when you build that, like, social muscle. At least that's when I did. You know, talking yeah, shit on Halo well, 2. We were, and, you know. yeah, well, we were playing. I mean, my parents, like most of the, the parents in the 90s, I mean, they would just open the door and throw you out in the morning, right? They're right. like, go, go play, you know? Mm -hmm. So Saturday morning cartoons are done, and then the expectation was get the fuck out, right? Facts. Dude. I don't want to see you all day. This is the day <laughs> mom, mom, and I clean the house or do this or you know or we're gonna go out and about or whatever. I don't want to see you until until tonight. Yeah, you know. Either uh, in or there's out. hot there's hot pockets in the freezer. Good luck, right? Yeah. And so, <laughs> yeah. So out the so out the door you went, and mm -hmm. there was so many when I was growing up. This. Um, and you don't see this very much, but the streets were completely littered with kids. Filled with kids. Yeah, yeah, filled to the brim. So we were playing. I mean, it, we were going to this guy's house for an hour to play video games. An hour later, we're playing Pogs. An mm -hmm. hour after that, we're playing Marbles in the street. Dude, God. you know what I mean. Two yeah. hours after that, we're in you know like um, a mock toy gun fight. <laughs> uh, you know, two hours later, we're in swim gear. You yeah. know, so it was always. We were just always doing shit, and we were always outside, and we were always socializing, and um, and that's all gone, right? Completely and gone. So, I don't so even see we, kids riding bikes. Well, yeah, and they're they're antisocial. Mm -hmm. Glued to right? screens. 
Yeah, it's, it's they're really, antisocial. Truly sad. Um, so, what kind of? I mean, you moved around a lot, so maybe it's not. Maybe this question isn't too relatable to you. But did you grow up in like, like on army bases or on military bases? Because no. I know base life is different from like living in the nope. burbs or something like nope, that. No, I just we would just move a lot because my mom would get. Um, sent to different facilities okay. and it would take a few years to clean those facilities up and get them on track before she was sent to other ones so mm, okay gotcha, gotcha. Um, that's why we would end up uh, kind of in you know different mostly now mostly um, this was just between two states right but a lot of places within those two states so all I lived all over California I lived all over Nevada um, so mostly between those two states okay gotcha what age did you start getting into this debate thing because I feel like that's something that either you got into it early and you're really good or you're really bad at it. And it seems like you get featured on, you know, podcasts, whatever podcast, primarily like, like Brian really leads on you. And it seems like you're kind of an expert at debate. Like mm-hmm. when did that start? Uh, when I was, uh, 36. <laughs> oh, so you didn't even really start doing this until you were well off into your thirties. I figured you were on the debate team when you were in like middle school. So talk to nope. me about like when you started Nothing. this debate journey. Well, I've always, um, I've always been, been very interested in politics so um political discussions for me that's that's for me you know how people sit down and watch sports they'll watch like football and shit like that that's what the primaries are for me right that's that's <laughs> God, my football. It's so boring to me <laughs> yeah right exactly right and but that's how it is with me with football right? oh, okay, somebody okay, calls me up and they're like hey man you want to come watch a football game? I'm like, no, I would rather go pull my teeth out with fucking pie. I don't give a shit about this, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know any of the players. I don't, you know, like, oh, I don't know shit, anything yeah. about it. I don't care, right? It means nothing to me. Yeah. So, so kind of my, my sports was politics. Now, mm. politics is interesting because it's really just interpersonal conflict, right? Yeah. That's what politics is in, in its frame is interpersonal conflict. So I had no idea. I mean, I would argue with people online, of course, probably like everybody does, but we're talking just small skirmishes, that kind of thing, right? Yeah. Uh, when the lockdowns happened, I got involved um, with a with a group that was on YouTube for a little while that's, that started as a Facebook group. And um, I just went on and started trashing the libs, and one of them said, why don't you come on camera? You, yeah, you know, <laughs> do it. And so I was like, fine. So I did, right? And just wrecked all of them. Yeah, thrashed them. And then the next day they, they texted me and was like, well, there's a guy here who says you're an idiot and blah, blah, And I said, oh, yeah? Well, so then I went on and wrecked him too. And then the next day there was another one. The next day there was another one. And I was I was stuck at home, right? Didn't have a lot to do. Yeah. Uh, I was laid off from work and uh, like, like millions of people. Mm-hmm. So um, I was like, well, this is kind of fun. So I started going on and wrecking more and more and more of them. Uh, I had no intention whatsoever ever of getting into podcasting. I had no intention whatsoever of ever getting into entertainment at really? all. That was never part of my life's plan, not even a little bit. So uh, it just you, sort of happened. So when did you start your channel, YouTube? <laughs> About three three years ago. Okay, and is that when this whole wrecking lives on Facebook started? And yeah, about whole, okay. that was about three and a half. I think about three and a half years ago. Okay. So, and then that channel dissolved. Um, It became a really successful debate channel, but the people who owned the channel, there was some drama and conflict, which came up. Hmm. Uh, I won't, I won't bore you with it, but the, uh, the channel ended up uh, being dissolved. And after it was dissolved, I wanted to continue with debates. So I started a debate channel called the crucible where I would host live debates. Right. And that's why I'm a very skilled moderator. I've hosted hundreds upon hundreds of live debates. Hmm. Well, what happened as a result of that uh, was that I had a front line seat, a front row seat to every single major kind of personality doing debates day in, day out for years. And so I've heard every argument you can imagine. I know kind of the philosophies inside and out. I know where people stand on things, where they don't stand on things. And uh, I also am very articulate, have good good social skills, and I'm able to utilize good rhetoric. So uh, you can imagine, imagine for two years, all you ever did was listen to people debating every issue you can imagine under the sun, you start to recognize that there's only a few different co- types of logic trees that yeah. people can actually go down, and only a few different types of arguments people can make, because the entailments of those arguments will always lead to X, right? Mm-hmm. 
So once you start to understand that, um, then you dive in, you can temper it with, uh, with philosophical understanding and then structured argumentation, uh, which would be like, um, uh, you know, logic, essentially. You're talking about uh, structured logic here. Once you understand how to apply all of those together, you can become extremely skilled at debate. But I mean, you gotta, you have to remember that I've been doing this for years, right? right? And so, of course, of course, I would get very skilled at it. No, that makes it'd be sad if you weren't. I've noticed you do that a lot, like using people's own logic really against them, like stating their argument and like saying, like, "Hey, I accept your side, mm -hmm. but now you have to see mine." Kind of diffusing them completely. I, I notice at least the hardest thing for you sometimes is like getting them to understand their own logic and be like, hey, yeah. I, I, like, especially on the whatever podcast, bro, it's, I see you sometimes. I'm like, bro, like I can explain it, but I can't make you understand it. <laughs> well, I was I, one, one of the uh, kind of few gifts I think I, I was, I was given, you know, say from, from God or what <laughs> is that I have a lot of patience. Um, yeah, you do. I'm a very, I'm a very patient man. And I've always thought that if you can engage long enough in discourse with somebody, you can you can likely get them to see your point of view. Yeah. And uh, and that's worked really well for me. Right. Is we, I've been able to engage with people over a long period of time, multiple, many conversations. And that has turned many people who initially hated me into big fans in fact once they could really understand what it is i was trying to articulate yeah and the things i was trying to do yeah i don't uh, at least uh, at least my social circle i haven't said met anybody that's like i hate andrew wilson uh, um, a lot of the people that at least that i see throw shade at you is like tone policing i don't like the way you said it it hurts my feelings well they throw shade at me for that uh being a stepfather um you know just kind of like stupid shit like that they throw <laughs> they throw shade at me for that kind of stuff. But that's like the light stuff. That's the easy stuff. It's like, whatever. And if it bounces off you, who, who like really cares? Yeah, so, I don't give a shit. It's yeah. Well, it's never bothered me. The The thing that's really funny is um, people, when people bring this up, they never really bring it up uh, when I have an opportunity to defend myself. Yeah. Because when they do, <laughs> they get completely fucking annihilated. They just kind of use it as like a, a jab. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Like a little jab, little little something like this. And because people misunderstand what the red pill is. So I took a challenge, right? The challenge I had, I didn't understand what the red pill was myself. And I was ridiculing it one day and a guy DM me and he was like, listen, he said, why don't you really focus on some of the red pill creators and have some, some good faith conversations with them, try to understand their point of view before you ridicule it. And now the first thing you want to say when somebody says that is, ah, fuck you. I know everything, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, of but course. instead of do instead of doing that, I said, okay, you know what? That's a good idea. So I set up some various conversations with guys, Rolo Tomasi, other large uh, kind of red pill creators. Mm -hmm. uh, another one, Alex PWF. He dealt a lot in those circles and I would go on his channel and do debates um, and this type of thing. So I was able to really begin to understand the ideology, which is not an ideology at all. I liken it to just a data packet. The idea is just um, these are descriptors for what we think reality is, but we're not giving you any oughts for what you should do with these descriptors. We're just telling you what is true. Mm -hmm. Now, not everything that uh, you know red, uh, different red pill advocates say is true, of course, right? And data is going to fluctuate, this type of thing. But they really don't mean to try to give people oughts or what you should do. They're just trying to tell you what is true. Mm -hmm. And so, but because of that, there's, there's sort of this side effect that people don't expect, which is this. If you tell people descriptors of truth, but you don't give them any oughts, right? Whatever they think they should do with that information, they ascribe to you as having told them to do that with it yeah exactly so for instance if you say um women don't mind if men are promiscuous okay but men generally seem to mind if women are promiscuous facts what well, now you haven't told anybody what to do here yeah. okay <laughs> you haven't said what anybody ought to do mm -hmm. with with that information you've just said this seems to be the case that you know, every time we do polls and we look at data and we look at what the responses are, that women seem to care about this a lot more than men seem to care about this. Right. Now, a person takes that information and says, wait a second. So that means I can go out and fuck a bunch of chicks. That's exactly. And yeah. a bunch of chicks aren't going to worry about it. <laughs> and so so then I should do that. And mm -hmm. then what they do is they say, well, I don't want to do that. That sounds gross. 
And so what they do then is say, the red pill says that I should go out and hump a bunch of chicks. <laughs> so this is how they get there, right? So true, dude. And, and it never happened. Yeah, like, no, it no, just never. never happened. It was a complete product and fabrication of your own mind, right? It's so funny to me. <laughs> so complete true, though. fabrication of your own mind, <laughs> but that's but that's what happens. And so this this also happens to me. It's ascribed to me often when I'll say things like, "Look, uh, you know, OnlyFans really bad for women to do, um, not just from the religious perspective, but from just the the kind of data that we have on how bad the results." of, of uh, the lives of many of these women are, as soon as they hit the wall and that kind of beauty standard goes away and how miserable they seem to be. Seriously. It's something I would definitely stay away from. It's a bad idea and you shouldn't advocate for that, mm -hmm. right? This becomes a standard of Andrew Wilson hates women. <laughs> he hates pr prostitutes. <laughs> All he does is attack women on their past right yeah, yeah. things like this and it's like no nothing could be further from the truth mm -hmm. i want to see grace come to these women yes. i want to see reformation come to these women i only attack women and men based on the standards they hold right now so only what you're advocating right this second will i ever attack you on yeah you having done something in the past um and then reform from that great that's the whole point of the religion i'm advocating right, right yeah, yeah. Great. <laughs> that's that's fantastic right mm -hmm. and those are some like the staunchest kind of uh, people in the trench fighting yeah. are those people so uh, do you... the the reformed coomers and so the oh, thing yeah, is, no, right, is, yeah. is, I, is i'm just like look you're probably a fucking reformed coomer dude <laughs> like so many so many men and women both uh, are and it's like so so kind of the only argument the other side has is why well, aren't you some kind of hypocrite and it's like well no i'm not advocating for this ideology right now you are yeah, yeah. <laughs> right no i do 100%. but this is but this is how people um this is how people come into kind of these bad thought processes mm -hmm. well, it happens a lot and especially in the manosphere red pill content i feel like everybody at least some of my friends have seen my success on youtube and been like dude i can't believe you're talking about this stuff and i'm like what you want your girl to have a high body count? You want her to sleep with a bunch of guys? You want her to be super promiscuous and, and try to Frankenstein men? That's what you want? Well, no, I don't want that. That's what I'm talking about. Like, so do you, wh why do you think people have such a, a hard time accepting like Manosphere content, red pill content? Why do you think that's such a, is it because we're so woke now and everybody's so liberal and it's like sexual freedom and have armpit hair and crazy dyed hair? Like, like, what do you think? What do you think? Why people are so like ruffled? Their feathers are so ruffled by the stuff. Well, so I'm I'm going to give you an answer that you're probably not going to like, but it's <laughs> it's the truth. Um, it actually doesn't have anything to do with how provocative red pill content is. It doesn't have anything to do with how provocative the stances are, though they are perhaps provocative. Hmm. I would say, for instance, like transgender ideology is far more provocative than red pill ideology. Oh yeah. Okay. So why is it that the result is different? Well, it has to just do with established patterns of thought. So anytime you go in, when people have established patterns of thought, think of it like a workplace. Have you ever gone into a workplace before and seen something or something different that can be done in an established process that would make the process better mm. or more efficient? Yeah. I'm sure you have, most people have, but then if you ever try to present it to a person in authority, <laughs> Uh, as to you know how you could change the process and have them actually adapt it, the answer is likely no. Yeah, always. And the reason is, well, this is the established process. We do things this way. This is the way things are done. You're here rocking the boat, and, and now you're a problem maker, right? Now yeah. you are a troublemaker. You are a problem child. You're a person who is here to make people's lives harder. You think you're better than everyone, right? It, it, it'll turn into all of those things. And all you're really trying to do is just, hey, this, this process just needs a little fixing in this and you know it'll it'll make this process better right um, the reason that that happens is due to established thinking once you have people who are set in an established way of thinking any deviation from that to them sounds idiotic so yeah, think it of does. it from their perspective from their perspective it sounds stupid like uh, assume for a second you said the Constitution doesn't make any sense right there's things in this that just don't make any sense it's bizarre and there's a bunch of shit in there we could change that would make it even better 
and people will lose their minds, oh, yeah. right? No, our entire court, our, our the entire nation is established on these principles and only these <laughs> principles, right? Yeah. They're going to lose their minds. Yeah, we are. But, but why, right? Well, because they feel like you're attacking an entire value structure. Yeah. Uh, so, so anytime you have established thought and then somebody comes in and they rock the boat, they become a target and they become public enemy number one. And if you want to know why red pill ideology if you even call it ideology or red pill content creators, whatever you want to call it, essentially the manosphere space who challenges the feminist ideal is uh, ruthlessly attacked only because they stand in opposition to established thinking. Yeah, 100%. So if there's toxic masculinity, is there also toxic femininity, you think? I don't think there's any toxic masculinity. <laughs> elaborate, elaborate. Well, I think that um, when we talk about masculinity, we talk about femininity, we tend to move towards kind of uh, established social traits or what the leftists would call gender, right? Yeah. So we say, okay, uh, gendered male trait is, you know, X, Y, Z, because um, that's, that's masculine. Mm -hmm. I think it's deeper than that, and, it, and masculinity and femininity come from ontology itself or the nature of what man is and what woman is, and that there's some things there which are inescapable that only those two sexes can do, and the other one really can't do it well mm -hmm. if they can do it at all. Those are really the traits I would consider to be masculine traits or feminine traits. I don't think that women ever do well, for instance, with stoicism. Uh, though I think that there's some women who could, right? Uh, by yeah. and large, they do not do well with this because it's not part of their nature to do yeah. well with that. Agreed. However, I think on the other hand, the kind of nurturing uh, that women can do is part of their nature that men, though some can do it, will never be able to be mom. Yeah. And that's why even they, the old saying goes, even bad men love their mamas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? That's so true, um, though. Yeah, men men love their moms, right? Yeah. They adore them because there is some form there which is deeper than just femininity. Yeah. Even if their mom is kind of masculine, mm -hmm. they still love her to death because there's something deeper there than just, oh, it's feminine. Yeah. There's this kind of deeper ontological question that we can't really even get to because we, we just describe it on the surface level as a feminine quality, but it's not. It's a quality around the nature of what a mother is mm -hmm. and how she is. And we know it when we see it, and I don't think we can ever adequately describe it, uh, though men understand it, and I think women understand it. So when you say toxic masculinity, what you're really just saying is traits inside of social circles that we consider masculine, whatever the fuck that means. What does that mean? <laughs> Nowadays, who knows? <laughs> yeah, well, well, I mean, in, in any days, what would that exactly yeah. mean? I'm not sure. So going back to the, the masculine and feminine, my, I guess my definition of it would be masculine is provider, protector. Feminine is more nurturing, keeping the culture of the family alive, being the soft one, quaint, uplifting, elegant, empathetic. And I think men thrive most in their masculine and women thrive most in their feminine. Would you agree or disagree with that? Um, I, think, I think that it's hard to give a, a kind of descriptor for... Um, for which of those things is masculine and why, right? Mm. So, like, I think nurturing is masculine. Um, it just depends on on kind of how we're applying these terms, right? So, is there anything? Makes is there anything? For instance, when your son is sick, if you stay up late with him while he has a fever and you take care of him, I would say that that's very nurturing. Uh, yeah. Do you feel? Would you feel like a man was less masculine for doing that, though? No, I guess you got a point because the the terms aren't absolute. Yeah, so they no, don't make sense. They don't really apply uh, concretely, and and it's through that kind of vagueness that gender ideology has been able to rise up to begin with. The trans ideology to begin with is through the ambiguity of being able to describe a much deeper issue, right? Which is what is of woman and what is of man yeah, it's okay, not yeah. just what is of the masculine and what is of the feminine mm. but what makes up a woman her entirety of her being what do we think of when we think of woman 
Do I think that the physiological component of that is super important? I do. When I think of a woman, I think that she prob that she has a vagina, right? Yeah, <laughs> I think she has 100%. a vagina. She has boobs. She, yeah. I mean, that's what I'm. I'm pick the, if the second you say woman, that's what I picture oh, right, in my head. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All of those. Yeah. But I also, you know, what I think we picture more than anything, the thing we associate with woman more than anything else is reproduction. Yeah. And so. Since we think of it in terms, even women think of it in terms, right? Can reproduce. Yeah. Can reproduce. I think that all of the things that go with that can reproduce is of woman. Yeah. And so we encapsulate these kind of minuscule things like femininity being like grace and nurturing and things like that. I think that those capture a surface level of what we mean when we think of woman. I think that women have a specific ontology. It's very hard to describe, but that men can't be whatever that is. Yeah, oh, yeah, facts. And women cannot be whatever that is in reverse to the man. They oh, yeah. are not interchangeable widgets. What is of man is not of woman, and what is of woman is not of man. Yeah. And that is that. And because it's so hard to encapsulate these ideas verbally into descriptors, it's through the vagueness of language that these these sort of like leftist prongs can sneak in and, and uh, cling on and say, because you couldn't give me like this kind of perfect overview right. of a thing that you can only descriptively sense right um th then therefore the thing doesn't even exist mm -hmm. right so it's it's pure fucking madness yeah and so i agree with you right i just don't even think that you're capturing the image of what a woman is enough yeah, yeah. Descriptors, you know what i mean no that makes sense because i was and to your point it's funny that you even brought it up it's like in the ambiguity people could use that and be like, well, that's why we're so confused. Because I think right. it's all just gender dysphoria. People like a guy wants to be a girl, a girl wants to be a guy. I think it's just, you're just confused. You need mental health help. I don't, I don't really think it's like you feel like an actual woman. I feel like you're either probably a person that doesn't get enough attention and you see online that you'll get more attention if you try to transition. And that's, I see it as just like an attention play. <laughs> like you're well, starved for it. Because something is hard to describe doesn't make it actually very confusing to the senses. So mm. one of the oldest kind of things that you'll ever hear, um, and you've heard it from the oldest member of your family to some of the youngest members of, the, of, the, of your family, is this. You might say something like, man, yeah, she was being a real brat and this and that. And somebody said, yeah, she's a woman, <laughs> right? And it doesn't matter what generation it is, yeah. right? Well, how do they all know this? How do they all know? <laughs> well, how, how are they able to kind of capture this essence and then apply it generally to women? Mm -hmm. And the second they say it, tons of other men who are around are like, yep. Yeah, right? we get it. They, they capture the same exact essence. Mm -hmm. And this is the same thing as uh, women to men. Uh, oh, you know, he was super angry today. Well, yeah, he's a man. You upset him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Why don't you, you know, why don't you blah, 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 or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever the case is, right? Right. Uh, they're able to capture the same imagery in essence, just like we are, right? Yeah. So, so we, but this kind of pretend game that we can't <laughs> is like, if <laughs> yeah. it, it, describe, describe then, uh, you know, the physical characteristics of a dog versus a cat. They both have tails and ears and four legs and paws, right? Yeah. yeah. I've, oh, I've heard cats that bark and I've heard dogs <laughs> that meow, right? And it's like, it's so stupid. You, yeah, it's so stupid. <laughs> but it, it, and you just kind of pretend. Well, we can, we just can't capture what a dog is. Yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah it's like, so dumb. Yeah, we fucking can capture what a dog is, even if we couldn't perfectly describe for you. Yeah. Uh, you know the and it, it, but it's within the ambiguity and the limitations of language mm. that the progressives will strike and the feminists strike, right? And right. so our job uh, as debaters and as kind of. Um, you know, our job is rocks trying to hold back the waves of madness yeah. is to make sure that they can't sneak in through the kind of cracks of ambiguity by attacking their logical positions on this and just completely annihilating them when we ask them the kind of same questions in reverse, right? Yeah. So you don't know what a man is? No, I do. Well, then you describe one. <laughs> Well, I see well, that all the time it, on well it's anyone who says they're a man. Well, that doesn't make any fucking sense. Yeah. How, how, how does that? So they're in the same kind of descriptive position that you're in. Mm -hmm. And they just kind of pretend that you're the only one who's in it, right? Yeah, <laughs> Until yeah. you move it back the other way. Uh, and once you do that, people can see, well, wait a second. We really can capture what these ideas are, mm -hmm. even if we can't perfectly describe them. And you know what? That's every idea that's ever been. Yeah, facts. What age did you see this start becoming more prevalent where... Because when I do, when I was a kid, if you were, 
if you dressed in like in women's clothes, you just dressed in drag. You weren't in pretty, you were probably gay, but like yeah, you, you were weren't gay. trying to actually be a woman. Like no. when did you start to realize that like, oh my God, like this is a, because th- you, you, you know, you're a father. So I know mm-hmm. like you're probably trying to protect the innocence of your children. So they're not going to get, because when I'm a parent, I'm going to be like, I don't want you around people that are going to try to be shoving this down your throat. Like what, do you remember what age you started seeing this more and more? Was it when you were a kid or is it more now? Like no, in your thirties? It, this is, um, the, the trans phenomenon is a recent phenomenon at least in its current state. You're right. There was always like drag queens or goth kids yeah. who would dress in like weird weird ways and shit. But they were social pariahs. They were doing it specifically to be social pariahs. Yeah. The whole point was, look at me, I'm not like you. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not like you. I'm I'm different. Yeah, right? Well, I'm why do you want us to look at you? <laughs> yeah. Why do you want us to look at you so bad if you if you want to be, you know what I mean? Well, I don't, but I just I'm not I'm not going to conform, you know what I mean? It's that whole kind of indie grunge goth kid yeah you know uh that's that's where all this kind of garbage really started to come from Mm -hmm. was the kind of mixing and the ambiguity of Mm non-conformity so the non-conformity movement in the 90s you saw this with grunge and then you know goth metal and things like that it was i'm not going to conform to whatever the kind of societal social norms are yeah and because of that you get a lot of attention you do and once people saw that you get a lot of attention from doing that it brought a lot more people over to that well then you have to increase kind of the the thing that brings the attention so after a while people become acclimated to you being a goth and they stop giving a shit right yeah well so what what's the next thing we do well now we get tattoos of satan on our face okay now people become acclimated to that now what do we do uh how about i take a knife and cut off my balls right it's like so so you have to kind of keep the hype up for what non-conformity is Mm -hmm. But it's gotten so bad, it has concaved on itself. It has. Because now normal is non-conforming. It is. That's what's crazy. It's finally come full circle with being based is now like, oh, like you're a Trumper. You're conservative. Like what's wrong with that? I believe in the nuclear family. Well, well, look at the uh, the Keatons, right, from Family Ties. Mm -hmm. There was a conservative Keaton played by uh, Michael J. Fox, right? Mm -hmm. I think his name was Alex in the show, Alex Keaton. And he was a conservative. He wore the, you know, the tie and, yeah. and the suit and the whole nine yards. But the whole idea there was that he was part of the in group, part of the in crowd, very popular, right? Had his shit together. And you know, people, we we don't want to be like him, right? We want we don't want to conform in this. Yeah. But now in modernity, the year twenty twenty four. If you're the kid in the suit and the tie, and you're running at the the RNC, and you're trying to move into politics. Now you're the kind of nonconformist and the abnormal now. That's so true. And so, so now it's come, it's come full circle to where normal is the abnormal and the abnormal has become the normal. And so all of these kind of irregulars who were doing all the abnormal shit for attention are now doing what? They're detransitioning. Mm-hmm. They're, they're going and having a family. They're going, they're like doing everything they can to reach their hand into the other end of the cookie jar where there's yeah. still cookies left to eat, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, I, I have to make people mad somehow. It's right. so crazy to me that you thought that. I, I, I've, I've thought about that, but you putting it into words really makes it hit home where normal is controversial now. Yeah. <laughs> or it used to be not at all. Yeah, well, here, let me give you some examples of some normal things which will be called creepy. Okay, this is very normal stuff that would be called creepy. Hey, man, it was nice to meet you. Can I get your number so we can, you know, go out later? Maybe we can hunt. We could fish. We could do something like that. Yeah, sure, dude. That sounds great. That's creepy. That is creepy. Yeah, asking for somebody's number now. Yeah, you can't do that. That's creepy. Why is that creepy? Yeah, I don't know. It's yeah, you're. I have no. I have no. I have no fucking clue why that would be creepy in a million years, right? But, um. For the for whatever you know the nonconformist is or whatever, uh, well that's creepy. Uh, calling people on the phone, that's creepy. Creepy, yeah, I'm not right? uh, Talking if you're if you're 20 years older than someone, someone's in their 20s and you talk to them in your 40s, that's creepy. Yeah. Uh, almost almost every kind of normal social interaction uh, was labeled as being creepy behavior or labeled as being something other than normal. Right. And Mm -hmm. so what they did was they took all normal behavior and created the category of abnormal for it. And so now that's what people pay attention to. So now the abnormals are doing everything they can to transition towards normalcy. (laughs) (laughs) That's so true, though. 
Yeah, yeah you can watch him just freak out. All you have to do, like for instance, is say no to a woman and just watch the fucking watch oh, the dude. veins and everybody's head pop and burst everywhere, mm -hmm. right? You but what's abnormal no about that? The only thing that's abnormal about that is that you have pushed in society that it's abnormal to do that. And so then when a person does it, even though it's totally normal to yeah. do and regular to do, mm -hmm. because you have pushed that it's abnormal, everybody pays attention to it. And then all your attention goes away, right? Yeah, so it's, that's it's so like, true, though. It's a double entendre. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy to think. Yeah, because I, I don't remember the last time I've asked for anybody's number, whether it's a friend or yeah. I've, I've been in a relationship for a while. Usually go for the social media first. Like, eh, you got you got Snapchat, you got yeah. Instagram. But yeah, it's like, it's so, yeah, and people are deathly afraid of phone calls nowadays. Ooh, yeah. And, and God forbid a, a FaceTime call where you have to be, or even hanging out. I think, I think COVID had a lot to do with that. People reclused a lot. They were comfortable staying home. They don't have to go out. Everybody's doing work from home jobs. They want to do the least amount, get paid the most. And even with like my social circles, like it used to be so easy to coordinate things with friends. Now it's like an act of freaking Congress just to get like, hey, let's all get together and go have brunch. And it's, it's very weird. Well, um, about, I'll tell you an interesting story on this, okay? Very briefly. Uh, years and years ago, a man who shared my dad's name got a delivery of lumber that was meant for my dad, mm -hmm. right? And he realized that there was a mistake, and he called my dad on the phone and said, you know, a, this, this package of lumber mistakenly got sent to me. And so they worked together with the lumber company to get this, you know, taken care of and this and that, right? And they became kind of over the course of this small exchange kind of friendly on the phone, and they kept in contact with each other. That's cool. And they've been friends for years and years after, oh, that's cool. right? All based on a, a bad package delivery. Mm -hmm. And it's like strangers having social interactions, which lead to friendship is how friendships are made Facts. <laughs> because all of your friends start as strangers. Yes. And what, what has happened is you've made it creepy to have a social interaction with a stranger. I mean, and so you're right, people yeah. go, where's all my friends? I, how, how the fuck? They start as strangers, stupid. Yeah, they don't they do. start as your friend. Mm -hmm. how, how do they start as your... They're not born out of the womb with a stamp that says, <laughs> John Smith's your friend. Yeah, true. <laughs> That's so true, though. And yeah, and I feel like a lot of kids now don't even know how to make a friend. They're like, well, how do I socialize? Like, well, it's right. Just, well, yeah, that, that would require speaking to people that you don't know. Yeah, which is terrifying <laughs> probably to a lot of people. Well, not just terrifying, but almost a social taboo. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Almost You're, an abnormal social taboo, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, and so you, when you make everything creepy, <laughs> the people who <laughs> then can maintain typical kind of social structures where they can talk to strangers, they can be the life of the party, they make fast friends with everybody, mm -hmm. they're just going to rocket ship to the top of the hierarchy instantly. It's so just true, rocket ship to the top and mm -hmm. other people will see then they'll be mad and they'll say oh, it's creepy and it's weird and it's 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 a, it's a cult <laughs> they'll say everything they can say it's a cult but the truth is is that cult. the person just rocket shipped to the top of the hierarchy because they have basic social skills it's so true which though. you have spent your entire life saying they're creepy to have <laughs> that's so true though do you think that you think that having those social skills is what helped you grow your channel as quickly as you did because i mean oh, what are you 100 and something thousand subscribers now yeah yeah of course of course yeah. and i started from scratch i knew no nobody in the industry i had no contacts i have no family in media i have no you know i had nothing yeah, yeah. that and uh started it totally from scratch i also had no intention of ever being a podcaster mm -hmm. and so that gave me many advantages too where i was not kind of stuck with traditional content creation i make some of the best content anywhere on youtube even if i'm not on whatever i'm doing different TikTok invasions arguing with people across all sectors of the internet i love it the crucible is just a ton of fun i mean people love coming and watching the show mm -hmm. Because I'm not beholden to kind of conventional thinking when mm -hmm. it comes to content creation. So, yeah, absolutely. Having basic social skills <laughs> has, uh, has assisted with this more than any other thing, I would right. say. Well, and then I also think not being afraid to be controversial is a big thing. A lot of people are so afraid. A lot of my friends are afraid of what other people are going to think. Oh, I may lose my job. This may happen. What, well, what do you think other people are going to say? Like, I don't give a damn. And I'll tell no. the channel, at least when I'm, you know, making reaction videos, I, my content's a little bit different from yours because I don't have somebody to interface with, but like, I don't care what other people think. And I think you've got to have a little bit of that fuck it in your system to say, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah. Have you ever had family members or friends say like, Andrew, you've changed. I see your channel. I didn't know you were really like this. Has any of that happened to you since I've seen your content? No. No? Well, you've been conservative since you were a kid, so it's probably yeah. like... I, I haven't... Listen, I've have never... I haven't changed. 
nothing nothing about me has changed right my views same views i've had basically my entire life now none just of that has changed yeah the only distinction is that i've gotten far more skilled at rhetoric and debate and delivering those mm -hmm. ideas to a core audience and also i've grown as an entertainer right i mm -hmm. mean most of this business is entertainment 100 entertainment being the delivery system for the idea yeah and so i've always put the focus on entertainment and it's very entertaining and if, it, if people are entertained they're going to watch and the ideas are going to come from them engaging right Thanks. with the the entertainment portion so i've always focused on that aspect of it understanding what this business really was and that's why i've really excelled at it mm -hmm. uh, also you know there's these other like pesky things for instance i'm not mentally ill therefore other <laughs> content creators enjoy working with me yeah. um, you show up I'm on time a, yeah i show up on time i'm not a backbiter i'm super dependable i'm yeah. exactly where you I, and every show that i go on is 100 percent guaranteed to make you more money mm -hmm. and give you a much larger audience and so when you have all of those things kind of moving for you it's very easy uh to be invited on every show on planet earth all the time right. because uh you're you're extremely low risk you're going to show up you're going to deliver and everyone is going to do better because you're there and there's not many content creators who that's true of no you're right and well this this space is very unprofessional um very like people just don't show up they ghost they are not communicative so i can see no how social skills bro yeah well that too yeah well and then the business acumen of like communicating back and forth like i know we've been talking on twitter for a while but like i almost just knew that you would show up and yeah. you wouldn't be like hey man i'm sorry dude i'm uh, my bad like i just knew that you wouldn't because i was like andrew's an older guy he seems very professional so let's go back to when like you started getting on these podcasts are these people reaching out to you at this point or they're like andrew love your content or are you like slowly building your channel up with content to get those eyes on you or were you reaching out to other people uh well what what happened so i i have a again kind of a different story in this sphere so uh not the conventional path i was an in-house debater for a channel until that channel went away this facebook group kind of tied to the, yeah, yeah yeah tied to it okay, so okay. then i became when i started the crucibles the debate channel uh, i would have bigger guests on and i kind of knew them having debated them even before right ah. and so now there was a different side that people could see of me which wasn't just in debate mode mm. and i also began to focus on the entertainment aspect once i focused on the entertainment aspect people would come to the channel because it was just a lot of fun yeah and from there kind of moving into the marketing of larger debates was easy at the if you're asking at this point at this point i get reached out to by every major content creator on planet earth well i've noticed and ever and essentially every small one as well the distinction being is that i don't mind taking time so so here's my daily routine even when i'm not working or prepping which i always am for the next stream i take two hours every single morning every morning i get up I pour coffee and before I have breakfast, I sit down for two hours and I respond to my DMs, all right? And it's hundreds, hundreds Dude, of them. And try to talk. Good, to you, good on you, bro. That's try to so talk hard to, to do. Every person who has sent me a message, I try to at least send them one back and let them know I did read your message because I think that it's a privilege for me to have fans, I don't think that it's your privilege to be a fan. I Facts, think it's my dude. privilege to have a fan. So agreed. I take time to do that every single morning. And people are usually stun locked by this. I can't mm -hmm. believe that you're responding to me. I'm a nobody. I'm like, well, we're all fucking nobodies. Dude. Yeah, literally. Um, but the the thing is, is um, I you know, but this is the level of entitlement that you see with creators. Dude, now. it's bad. Um, now, one who I will give credit to who does not do this is Destiny. Destiny is uh, pretty pretty highly responsive also to his audience. Hmm. I think that he also sees it the same way I do, that it's a privilege for him to have fans yeah. rather than your privilege to be a fan. Hmm. And so I take, I, I do, I take uh, two hours a morning and I do that. And then, um, and that's no matter what's going on, right? right. See, no matter where I am and then, you know what I mean? If I have a podcast at eight o'clock, I'm getting up at six and I'm responding to for two hours for, you know what I mean? That's, right. and I, I promised that I was always going to do that. It, now this wasn't a promise to my audience, but just to myself, right? right? If this if this ever takes off, I'm going to make sure that I'm not a piece of shit to the people who have made the crucible happen, which is just thousands upon thousands upon thousands of fans. So yeah. uh, I and respect then, that big time, man. That's so hard. And is this mainly <laughs> like Twitter DMs or is this like YouTube comments? 
Instagram it's all of them. comments. It's Instagram, Twitter, emails, all of it. Damn, right. that's tough. Because, dude, I, I, since my channel has been getting more traction, like, I used to reply to every single comment, but I have thousands of, un, like, I just, I'll heart a lot of them, but, like, it gets to the point where I'm like, how do I even, now, DMs yeah, I don't and stuff go is through, different. I don't go through every single comment. That okay. would be impossible. Yeah, it's, but yeah, I, it's, it's almost too many. But, like, but DMs, I, do, I respect that. DMs. I do go through every single person who wanted to reach out yeah. and, and say something. And, by the way, that includes haters. So even people oh, who say horrible, haters. horrible fucking things to me, mm -hmm. I'll usually say something nice back. That's what I do. And say, you know, do you want to try to have a conversation before you form this opinion? Mm -hmm. And now most of the time it's no, but occasionally it's like, you know what? I kind of do, you know, that, I hey, kind of do. So great. Yeah, great. But also um, the, so the next thing I do every night before I go to bed, I uh, categorize with my team how many people reached out who want interviews and want to have discussions and want to do this and blah, 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 blah. And where can we fit them in on the schedule? So sometimes people get very upset with me because I'll book them out eight weeks and they're like, wow, why can't we have a conversation now? You know what I mean? And it's like, dude, <laughs> I got a life. Um, I got other yeah, shit I got, going. I got, exactly. I got a life, yeah. got things going, uh, but, but we're, we're going to get you on. And by the way, most content creators who are my size have as much engagement as a channel. There's plenty of channels out there with 130,000 subs who nobody fucking watches. Okay? Facts, dude. Because the subs are bought and the people mm -hmm. are, are phony as shit and this type of thing. But I mean, the Crucible averages on a slow night, three and a half thousand live viewers. And if we're actually doing something that is super fun, six, seven, eight thousand live viewers. And that's a insane. Really, that's a it's lot. A, very very heavily engaged with channel yeah uh, i'd say in the top 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 percentile for a channel its size right 100 oh, I mean, six thousand live viewers percentile. for one hundred thirty thousand subs yeah that's insane happens all the time yeah right but the average even the average is insane at about it's it holds average now about 3.5k yeah so well, it's see, like, when you're just chilling it's like a 1300 people i'm like hell yeah andrew like well, that's, that's 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 on uh that's usually just when we're starting the stream so usually an hour in uh, it'll usually be 1300 before I even turn the camera uh, or not when I, before I turn the camera on, but right when I turn the camera on, it'll be about 1300. And then about an hour later, it'll usually climb up to around uh, 2.5 to 3000. Mm -hmm. And then it usually holds around 3.5 about an hour and a half into a stream. So, yeah, it's really I mean, we impressive. Do, we do really well on the live engagement. But then if we're doing debates or we're doing something else, not uncommon for me to have six, seven thousand guys like Dave Smith come on. Not uncommon for us to have 10, 11, 12, 13,000 live viewers. That's crazy. We're just really up there in the percentages here. Mm -hmm. And then when I do whatever, same thing, we hold at around 4,000, usually 5,000. They hold around, you know, 12, 15. Um, so, you know, and this is all venues, right? Just, so it's not just YouTube. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we do. I mean, we do really well. So the thing is, though, is that I do want, I don't mind going on channels that are much smaller with way less engagement. I just wish that some people weren't such bitches about it. You know yeah, what I mean? Dude. Like, the, and I'm just like, dude, I'm already happy to come on. Just, you know, Give just me some time. Work, work with me here. Yeah. You know, <laughs> dude, I respect it. When I reached out to you, I did not expect a reply. I've sent out so many DMs and I think I was trying to get you on when I was like maybe 30 K subs. I'm. I'm over 70 now, but I was like, I didn't, I never thought, oh, if I have more subs, people will take me more serious. I think it's like, if you're good and you're professional, people will show up even if you have 5K, 10K. I That's would, true. you know what I mean? But like, yeah. maybe not a lot of people think that way. Um, but it's interesting. Did you ever think that your channel would get to this point? Or were you like, do you wake up some days like, how the fuck did I get here? Because I feel like that sometimes. I'm like, how did I even get here? No, I, well, I knew if I, um, I sat down with my wife and said, look, I want to move to part-time. Uh, working part time, and I want to work full time on the channel. Yeah. And the channel wasn't bringing in enough to do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so it, there was a lot of risk in that. And she was like, Well, you know, it, it's a risk. And I said, Listen, I know if I can work at this and I can just focus on this. If this is, was my primary focus instead of, um, you know, working at my job, if I switch those roles and instead of YouTube part time being full time and the job being part time instead of full time, I think that I can really make something great out of this channel. Yeah. And she was, you know, 100% supportive immediately and was like, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, you know, if you if you really think you can do that, then go for it. Within the first month, within the first month, uh, I far surpassed the expectations and we just kept going. Right. right. And we worked extremely hard. I mean, I work really hard at this, as you know. Yeah, dude. Um, it's a lot but, of time. 
Yeah, well, it's not just a lot of time. It's a lot of production, a lot of ideas, a lot yeah. of organization. You know what I mean? A lot of a uh, lot of flying around. You mm-hmm. know, yeah. a lot of uh, uh, content collapse, and you have to always be able to perform, right? Always. So it's always high level performance every single time, mm-hmm. and that can be very taxing. I'm not saying that this is uh, of a hard, as hard as manual labor. Not even no. close. I'm not <laughs> no. not making not making that comparison. I'm just saying that it, it can be very mentally taxing. So, yeah. in in any case. Um, yeah, we've been, so, so we've been able to just kind of climb and climb and climb. So I did know, I think I, I felt anyway, that if I was able to focus my time and attention on the career itself, uh, that I would do very well. Mm -hmm. And, um, so, so yeah, I, I, I'm not, uh, altogether unsurprised with the success. That's good. If you don't mind me asking, what did you do before you were doing this? Was it like a specific trade or? Yeah, so I did uh, robotics engineering, robotics repair, and robotics mechanics. Oh, I've heard you talk about that. Okay, okay, gotcha. Mm-hmm. So, what exactly did that entail? Like, that's pretty random. Yeah, to me. I worked. I, don't know much about I worked it. mostly inside of the uh, food industry, which um, which mostly uses either uh, compound machinery mm-hmm. or robots, and uh, I worked on on both. These are all electrical. Uh, components because in the food industry, obviously, you can't use gasoline motors, things like this. Right. That would create all sorts of problems around the food, right? right. <laughs> so <laughs> everything is all in there, never heard. <laughs> yeah, everything is a sterile environment, and it's yeah. all driven by electricity. Mm-hmm. And so there's a combination of uh, basic machinery, complex machinery, and robots. And I worked on all of those. And so my job was essentially to work on various food lines. Uh, repairing and designing and fabricating, uh, in many cases, parts for uh, robots and complex machinery. Yeah, and I've noticed your primary platform, it seems like, is YouTube. Do you also post on Rumble, other spots too? Well, my primary platform is the crucible.video. So I have a membership site, and that's where where you can find 99% of the content that Andrew Wilson has ever done, the back catalog. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's all member-driven. Uh, and that is the kind of my primary uh, YouTube. I also utilize a ton. Right. Also Rumble, also other uh, you know kind of social media platforms. But we're all over the place. Uh, YouTube is just one of many kind of platforms that are at our disposal. Right. So what's the big goal for your channel? Are you trying to be like the debate king? Or are you trying to be you know like what what is what is the purpose of the channel for you? The Crucible, at least. Well, so the the Crucible has always been designed around being an all-encompassing entertainment channel. So the ultimate goal for the Crucible is not just to have some of the most kick-ass debates and engagements, uh, but also to have extremely hilarious content, which we do, and also uh, to have skits, bits, uh, and various forms of interactive social media. Mm. And so we do everything from writing our custom songs to doing <laughs> custom bits and skits. You write your songs, to, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, to, um, to doing all different sorts of, uh, of satire, mm-hmm. which is the comedic aspect. Also, it has some of the best political analyzing around uh, with current events, news, things like that. Yeah. But we also bring debatetainment, which is kind of the blood sports, brutal left versus right, uh, no holds bar debating, right. which uh, which people enjoy too. So the, the Crucible's primary function is as an entertainment platform for the delivery of right wing content, hmm. and the the ultimate purpose of that is I know uh, that the easiest way to deliver right wing talking points and deliver right wing ideas to people is to keep their mind entertained with what they're watching, so that they will pay attention to what it is that you're ultimately saying, nice. and it's also much more convincing. Oh, 100 percent. Do you ever find yourself debating some someone and they actually start agreeing with you by the end of it? Or most of the time, are they just trying to be combative and argumentative and say, F you, Andrew? Like, do you ever feel like you really get across to people? Happens all the time. Really? Mm hmm. I feel like you're based enough and a lot of your stuff is so. And also, in logic, also later, uh, even sometimes after an exchange is done where it was kind of a brutal, very combative exchange. Oftentimes, by the next day, a person will reach out and say, look, you made a lot of good points. Can we maybe have more of a conversation on this, you know, this part or this part or this part? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, it happens happens all the time. Really? That's surprising. Mm-hmm. I feel like most people would just be like, nah. Um, if you well, I'm not debate- saying the majority of the time, but it does happen. <laughs> does It does happen yeah. all the time. Yeah, it happens all the time. If you could debate any historical figure, who would it be and why? Um, well, man, that's a, that's a good question. Any historic figure. I would debate Napoleon Bonaparte. 
Why? Uh, I didn't like the Enlightenment principles behind the Napoleonic Code, and uh, also he was a fucking simp. So. <laughs> End the simp epidemic. <laughs> yeah, well, I would want I would want to know. Yeah, I'd want to know why he simp for the chick that he simp for. She was she was a disaster. Uh, but also, I just feel like Napoleon Bonaparte would be a really good debater for some reason. Probably would be. He actually probably wouldn't be. All right, I'm going to jump to this section I like to call this or that, just to see. These are some random things. Um, pineapple on pizza or no pineapple on pizza? Uh, people who demand pineapple on pizza <laughs> are ontologically evil. They're born uh, with demons inside of them. <laughs> and actually, that's the best way you can tell if a person is demonic and has demons in them. If you throw a piece of pineapple at them and they actually eat it, uh, especially if they put it on pizza, then you need to take them immediately <laughs> to your local Orthodox church and have an exorcism done. <laughs> that was not the answer I was expecting. Um, fight one horse-sized duck or a hundred duck-sized horses? A hundred duck-sized horses. Uh, wear shoes full of jelly or gloves full of peanut butter? Shoes full of jelly. That actually sounds kind of comfortable. <laughs> it <right>? does, right? <laughs> Gloves full of peanut, peanut butter. butter. Yeah, that, that sounds awful, dude. <laughs> yeah. that, that just sounds terrible. Uh, have a pet dinosaur or a pet dragon? Uh, pet dragon. Always sing when you talk or always dance when you walk? Sing when you talk. I could see you doing that. Get stuck in a room with a giant spider or a room full of clowns? A room full of clowns. Have fingers made of cheese or toes made of marshmallows? Uh, toes made of marshmallows. <laughs> be able to teleport anywhere or be able to read minds? Oh. That's a good uh, one. Read, read minds. Really? You would want to know? I wouldn't give a damn. I'd want to teleport. Why would you want to know everybody's thought processes? Well, what would you want to teleport for? Vacation? Yeah, but I mean, you just take an airplane, right? I mean, yeah, but going to Australia is a, a long way away. Nice yeah, but realize. like, imagine, imagine if you could read minds, how insanely rich you would be oh so my quickly. Oh my God, knowing everybody's that, problems. Well, no, not, you would forget the problems. Like you could just go and talk to, you know, somebody who's, who has some sweepstakes or something going, you know what I mean? And oh, just yeah, ask true. him the details of the sweepstakes and then just read the numbers from his mind, <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, you could, you could go and read all the dealers in Vegas's mind. So, you know, what cards they're holding. I mean, yeah, there's you, a lot. you're, you're like, your overwhelming advantage of being able to read what people can't say. Plus like you, if, if let's say the government knew that you had said skill, you oh, know what I mean? CIA. Like Secret what? Service. You could go to them and be like, okay, uh, you have this really high profile fucking guy who knows where the dirty bomb is. Right. Okay. You pay me a hundred million dollars and I'll go read his mind. You, oh, you dude, you, you would be very rich. Very yeah, quickly. you would be very rich very quickly. Uh, so, like, who gives a shit about teleporting at that point? <laughs> you right? could teleport to a bank, though, and steal gold. Nobody would know. Yeah, but if you went in, you could just read their mind and get the bank code anyway. <laughs> I mean, you got a point. That's a, very, that's a really good argument, Fred. That's a really good argument. Um, be a superhero with no powers or a villain with no weakness? Villain with no weakness. Uh, talk to animals or speak every language? Speak every language. Live without music or live without movies? Without movies. Always sneeze uncontrollably or always have the hiccups? Oh, man. That one's... That's like ninth circle of hell or ninth circle of hell. Yeah. That's like... <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I both of those to me are equally bad. Yeah, so they would just be they would just be interchangeable, right? You got to pick one. Uh, the hiccups. But just so you know, <laughs> sneezing's just as bad. So. Sneezing <laughs> sucks. You can yeah. at least hiccup through a conversation. Um, have spaghetti for hair or mashed potatoes for hands? Spaghetti for hair. Be invisible for a day or be able to fly for a day? Ooh. Invisible. Be followed by a duck wherever you go, or followed by a squirrel? Uh, I think a duck. duck I think a duck would be cooler. Yeah, um, duck. Have a rewind button for life, or a pause button? Rewind? Duh. And then yeah, who gives a shit about it? Well, wait, I don't even get that. That one's stupid, because you could pause if you have the rewind... Happening. Yeah, but if you rewind... Right? Isn't that the same as a pause, really? Because couldn't you just rewind two seconds ago? I mean, you could, but it would still be happening. 
I don't know. I guess so. You could keep rewinding, I guess, over and over and over and yeah. over. Maybe equate to a pause. And then the most controversial question I have here is, how many times can you use a towel after drying off before you need to wash it? Oh, my God. Have That's you ever... Like it's controversial. What, is it two? Is it three? Like, how many times can you use a towel before you need to wash it after drying off out of the shower? Like a full body shower where full you're like drying your balls off? You're drying your balls off, everything? All of it. How, how many? Is it just one for you? Is it I two? Just, I think just one, bro. So you, you dry off once and wash? Yeah. Yeah, I think you dry off once and then, you, you know, that towel gets a hamper. That's why you're supposed to have like 40 towels, bro. <laughs> and then and then you have a towel day. You know yeah. what I mean? Like I'm expecting your bathroom is just 50 towels. <laughs> we have a lot of towels, yeah. yeah. But, I can I mean, see why. You're taking a yeah. shower a day. A lot of damn towels. Yeah, dude. I don't want to, like, the next... I don't want to, like, dry my face off with a towel that I just dried my balls off with the night before. That just... I, I don't think so, dude. I think just <laughs> once, you know? I mean, that's, doesn't that sound reasonable? Just, like, one time is it fine. It is very reasonable. It is very reasonable. You just gotta... I guess you gotta just make sure you're not drying off with the same part of the towel every day, you know? Yeah. Switch it up. <laughs> well, th and now this miffs me because now, now I'm like, now I'm second guessing my whole life here. I'm like, have I? I'm pretty sure I've dried off with the same towel multiple times. I'm Were you rubbing your balls on your here. face? I think I was, if that's the case, right? Learn something new about you here today, buddy. Dude, you just fucked my whole life up, bro. <laughs> you, just tra you, just, you just traumatized me. You just trauma now I'm going to be trauma dumping on people, bro. Yeah, uh, dude, hey, well, that's how it is. Well, we got less than a minute on Zoom. Andrew, it's been an absolute pleasure, brother. Um, I'll put out this episode probably in the next week or so. But uh, you got anything else for me before I bid you adieu? Nope. My name is Andrew Wilson, host of the one and only Crucible, fastest growing debate platform and I think entertainment platform on YouTube. Uh, I'm a political satirist, a political analyst, a blood sport debater, and of course, wonderful entertainer. Also, I've been voted as having the sexiest voice on TikTok. <laughs> I have no idea why the people on TikTok love it so much, but they do. You can find me on The Crucible. Become a member of the crucible.video. You want to learn how to debate better? Go to Debate University. I have a course for you. And with that, Levi, thank you so much for Very having welcome, me brother. on today. Thank you.